Okay, good. And uh, what we're going to do uh, tonight is start to get into chapter three. I don't think we'll finish chapter three tonight, uh, but we should be able to make some pretty good headway to allow you to work uh, several of the modules uh, <clears throat> in chapter three uh, during the week here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just open up the text. Okay, and we really have been spending quite a bit of time around the income statement the last, uh, over the first two classes. Um, we looked at, you know, the presentation of the income statement, revenue recognition. Uh, chapter two was somewhat of a catch-all of different uh, topics, but we still uh, were looking at some issues related to accounting for um, income type items. Now we're going to uh, turn our attention solidly to the balance sheet for the next couple of classes. Uh, we're going to be dealing with assets in this class. <clears throat> we'll deal with investment assets in chapter four. We will talk about consolidation since when we talk about investments, we talk about the fair value through net income method, start to exceed certain thresholds of ownership, use the equity. And then as you continue to uh, exceed ownership in excess of 50%, then you consolidate. So that's why consolidation is in F4, F5, liabilities, F6, liabilities, the main one being their deferred tax. F7, we finish up with stockholders' equity, statement of cash flows, and then we'll turn our attention to not for profit and governmental accounting. So just to look forward uh, to some of the things that we've talked about, and then, like I said, be looked back, then look forward uh, to some of those topics now, really focusing on the balance sheet for the next several classes. So when we start to take a look at the table of contents here and contemplate potential point values, when we are talking about cash and cash equivalents, tends to be about five points on the exam. We're going to see that's fairly straightforward. We'll talk about trade receivables. And when we talk about trade receivables, we're going to be talking about accounts receivable. And the more important or more um, sophisticated discussion there is the allowance for doubtful accounts. That tends to be 10 points. The examiners like to focus on allowance for doubtful accounts. That means you will get several multiple choice questions. You may even get some task-based simulation. We will also talk about notes receivable. And the big thing with notes receivable being what happens when an entity goes ahead and does something called discounting a note receivable. Uh, that will be about five points on the exam. Inventory has long been a heavy area on the exam. Inventory is going to be about five points. And I'm just going to keep that in red so it shows better on the blue there. That's going to be uh, not five points. That's more like 10 points. That's long been a heavy area on the exam. That's going to be a 10 point area. You can expect potentially a task based simulation dealing with inventory. I'm going to talk about the different inventory methods LIFO, FIFO, weighted average, et cetera. Property, plant, and equipment. Okay, not too much there. That's pretty straightforward. So when we talk about property, plant, and equipment, and the various depreciation methods, not real heavy there. Uh, that's about five points. I'm hoping to get at least that far tonight. Um, when we come back next week, we'll finish up. I'm thinking the way the uh, flow is going to go for this, these sections for next week. Non-monetary transactions, eh, kind of a hard area. So that's why I don't want to try to push that towards the end here. We'll get into that at the beginning of next time. That's about five points. Intangibles is about five points. How do we deal with things like patents, copyrights, et cetera, goodwill? And then we'll finish up with impairment. Impairment's not too heavy, probably about two points. Okay, so you can see that as we start to move into the balance sheet now, pretty, uh, pretty intense point value. Uh, I think much of the information in chapter three is stuff that you're fairly familiar with, stuff that you're probably fairly comfortable with. So we're going to go through and review these things and you'll be in good shape to get all these points. Okay. All right. Good. So let's go ahead then and let's start out talking about cash and cash equivalents. Okay. Now let's just go straight to the example. and Let's talk about cash. 
coins, currency, on hand or cash, checking savings accounts, money market funds, even though you may have them on deposit, they are seen as cash, okay? Now, if the cash is held as a compensating balance against borrowing and it is not legally restricted, sometimes you'll have a loan and the loan will say, well, we're going to loan you a million dollars, but if you hold um, $200,000 on deposit with you, with us, the bank says the interest rate is only 3%. If you don't hold that, then the interest rate is going to be 5%. Well, that's not a legally restricted um, deposit, and so that would still be considered cash. Now, contrast that with what we say down here when we start talking about things that are not cash equivalents, and notice now we're coming down and we're saying, well, look, if there is a legally restricted, they tell you that you cannot draw down on that loan beyond, say, $800,000. You have to hold on $200,000, $100,000 on deposit, and it's legally restricted. They won't allow you to draw that down. That is seen as not cash. It is not cash because you can't use it as cash. You can't draw down on that. So go ahead and depo uh, deposit flashcard those contrasts there, which is if there's not a legal restriction on borrowing, the cash that you're holding as a deposit is still considered a cash equivalent. If it is legally restricted, and that's the key phrase, then it is going to be not be considered a cash equivalent. Now you start getting down here into negotiable paper. Negotiable paper, are things like um, money orders, that sort of thing. But I want to focus here on certificate deposits. And I want you to put certificate deposits and treasury bills. Okay. Certificates of deposit and treasury bills that have an original maturity. And write in here original maturity and put in here to the purchaser. to the purchaser of 90 days or less. If the original maturity to the purchaser is 90 days or less, then that treasury bill or certificate of deposit will be listed up with the cash and cash equivalents. It's literally on the line item cash and cash equivalents. You say, but a treasury bill is in cash. It is so highly liquid. And assuming the federal government doesn't default on its debt, which under this scenario was contemplated something that would never happen. I don't want to get into the current craziness in Washington, D.C., in which somebody thinks it'd be okay if the government defaulted on its debt, since we're going to assume that's a risk-free uh, deposit with a, not deposit, but a security that you can buy a treasury bill, and it has an original maturity to the purchaser of 90 days or less, it is seen as a cash equivalent if the original maturity to the purchaser on such items, and that also applies to the T-bills, is more than 90 days, it is not seen as a cash equivalent. Now, it would still be a current asset, but it's not a cash equivalent. So let's just go ahead, because I know that that uh, starts to get a little, huh? What exactly are we saying there? And let's say we get a T-bill, and we have T-bill, and it's T-bill number one. Okay, so this T-bill one, Okay, this is T-bill one, and say it is purchased on one, one, 22. Okay, T-bill one is purchased on one, one, 22. And uh, it matures on one, one, 23. Is this a cash equivalent? No. Answer is what? No, good. I think that was Eric. No, that is not a cash equivalent because it doesn't have an original maturity of the purchaser of 90 days or less. It's uh, 365 days, right? It's a year. It's a, not even really a bill anymore. It would be considered a note, but... That's a technicality we don't need to worry about, okay? Now, let's say we have T-bill two. And T-bill two, I guess I'll write it up here. 
T-bill two is purchased. On twelve one, <clears throat> twenty two, but it matures and it matures on the same date as T bill one, 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 twenty three. Is this a cash equivalent? Yes. Yes, it is because the what the original thirty to the purchaser was only what thirty days here. Now notice, guys, this T bill and T bills are identified by QCIP number, something called QCIP. This T bill, this note, whatever, may be the same QCIP number. It's the same note, but in one case. It was purchased as soon as it was issued in the other case by the treasury in the other case it was purchased after it already been outstanding for almost 11 months right okay question are these current assets let's ask that question how about t bill one is it a current asset yes Yes, it is, because it only had a one-year life, right? So it's a current asset. These are questions, right? How about T-bill two? Current asset. Both are current assets, right? But only T-bill one, uh, excuse me, T-bill two. Cash equivalent. Okay, excellent. Good, guys. Very good. All right. Okay, now let's take a look at cash, okay? And they say cash can be classified as unrestricted. Really? Are you really going to do this to me now? It can be classified as unrestricted or it could be classified as restricted. Okay. Now, if it is unrestricted, okay, unrestricted, always. A current asset. Unrestricted cash means it is always a current asset. Unrestricted cash is always a current asset. Flashcard that. If it is restricted, okay, then we have to look at the purpose for which it was restricted. Okay, so if we're talking about our restricted cash now, We look to the purpose that is restricted, and we're going to flashcard this, but it's pretty easy. If it is restricted and associated with a current asset, maybe we're restricting cash to pay some sort of payable, like an account payable or something, then the cash is considered current. If the restriction is associated with a non-current asset or non-current liability, maybe we're restricting cash and we're setting that money aside for when a bond becomes due, then that cash would be considered non-current. So a important takeaway from this discussion on cash, you look at cash and you think, well, cash has to be the most current of assets, right? Yet even cash can be considered restricted when we look at the company's intent. And a lot of times the classification of assets has something to do with what does the company intend to use it? What is the intent? Let me go ahead and take my laundry room out of the shop there. Not that it matters. That much. Mm -hmm. It's really necessary to have all these doors and printers open and whatnot. Okay. Question. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at um, <clears throat> the next page. And we don't need to look at all those examples of restrictions, but look, let's look at items to be included in cash. Now, guys, this is a good example, example of a timing exercise. The CPA exam gets this timing exercise. The CPA exam likes to give you a fact pattern and see if you know which period to include different items in. And the main takeaway here is we're looking to see if there's circumstances that tell us that an item should or should not have been included 
in this company's cash balance. So they start us out with this 160,000, and you can see we would start there. And then we're gonna have to make certain adjustments to this depending on what the facts tell us here, okay? So they say first that there is a $5,000 check payable to Smith dated January 8th, but was not included in the December 31st checkbook balance. Should it have been? It's dated January 8th, and it wasn't in the December 31st, year seven, balance of 160,000. Should it have been? No, because it was dated the next year. Good, so we would sit there and we would just ignore that on the CPA exam. In the olden days, when we took the exam hard copy, you know, we would I-beam that out so we don't look back at that fact. You're gonna have to figure out a way of I-beaming it out in your mind when you're taking your exam in the uh, computerized environment. Good. Let's take a look at this next one, a $3,500 check payable to Smith deposited December 22nd and included in that December 31st year seven checkbook balance was returned NSF, non-sufficient funds. That means it bounced, okay? So the check was redeposited and finally cleared um, on January 7th of year eight. Should that have been included in the cash balance at year seven? Uh, no, because it bounced. Yeah, it bounced and didn't clear till the next year, good. Kylie, anyone can answer on this, okay. Okay, good, so that's a negative 3,500. I'm not discouraging Kylie from answering. Okay, good, very good. All right, and then we have a $25,000 check payable to supplier drawn on Smith's account that was dated and recorded December 31st, but not mailed until the next year. Should, should have Smith subtracted that? The date was December 21st, but they didn't mail it until the next year, year eight. No, no, we hadn't mailed it yet. So it's still considered in our cash balance at December 31st, year seven. So we do what? Uh, we add back that 25. We've already seen we subtract out the 35 and we have the adjusted correct uh, cash balance. Okay, not very hard, guys. Timing exercise, you'll see some like that, some like that in your homework. Okay, all right, bank reconciliation. Okay, and the key thing here is simple. Okay, now sometimes, you know, when I'm talking to accountants, accountants don't uh, go through the formal process of reconciling their checkbook because you're sophisticated enough that you could probably eyeball it and figure it out. But let's just go ahead and look at this exercise. And guys, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. The one that I do want to focus on here, though, are bank collections. Okay. This is often called a lockbox. And what we do with the lockbox, sometimes when I mention lockbox, particularly the auditing class, someone says, well, it's a box with a lock in it. No, it is a function that is offered by banks. And what banks will do, usually large commercial banks, what they'll do is they'll collect cash from your customers on your behalf and deposit it directly. So when your customers pay, their bill to you, it doesn't go to your employees where they might open it and do something untoward with it. Uh, instead, um, the money goes directly to the bank. And when the bank informs you that that cash collection has been made, then you will go ahead and update your books for your cash balance by debiting cash, probably crediting either, probably crediting accounts receivable at that point because you received something on a receivable, okay? We've already seen that NSF is what is a bounce check, okay? Now you come down and you start to take a look at the reconciliation. And when you have a reconciliation, the question will tell you, well, the book records show a cash balance of 12,650, okay? Meanwhile, the bank statement is showing us what? It's showing us that there is 10,050 in the cash balance, okay? Now, the bank statement also tells us some additional things about a bank service charge and this NSF check. Now, the way I look at reconciliations, I ask myself, well, what is it that the uh, bank knows about that the company doesn't know about? I'm going to adjust the company's book balance for that.
But there's also things that the company knows about that the bank didn't know about at the year end, say December 31st. Those tend to be, and you can see that those tend to be deposits in transit and outstanding checks. These are deposits that the bank had not been aware of. They were already considered deposits at year end or checks that were written at year end. They hadn't cleared the bank until the next year, right? So what do we do? We take whatever the book balance is and we update it for things that what that the bank knew about that the company didn't, the bank service charge, the NSF check, that are both subtracts. That gives me the adjusted cash balance here of 12,550. Then I take the bank balance and I start adjusting it for things that the company knew about that the uh, bank did not. The deposit in transit has to be added. The outstanding checks have to be subtracted, right? And I get the uh, now balance, which is the correct cash balance of 12,550, okay? All right, very, very simple is the key word there, okay? For the CPA exam, you don't have to worry about a four column reconciliation, okay? So we're just gonna go past that for the sake of time here. And let's go ahead and let's jump ourselves into our first multiple choice question for tonight. Pauline, I cannot hear you. I, I don't think I heard you at all. Paulina, I don't think I heard you. <clears throat> Okay, guys, what's going on? We're two minutes into this and I've got half the class participating. What's up? What's going on, guys? Okay, I'll start calling folks out. Um, so, Ash, what did you get for this one? I got um, D, a million nine hundred thousand. Okay, did you pick D? My ch my like thing went away, so I couldn't even pick it. The pull gone from my screen. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one then. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And uh, the correct answer um, is C, which most of us got this correct. Well, let's go ahead and uh, see what we can come up with here as we take a look at this, okay? And we start out and they wanna know what should be included as cash 
and cash equivalents. Okay, December 31st, year two. So is cash in a checking account a cash equivalent? Yeah, that one's pretty easy. Is cash in a money market account cash equivalent? Yeah, that's pretty easy. Now at this point, you know, A would come into play. So I think the examiners were kind of like, okay, we know you know that that's cash because you couldn't get to the choices, any of them without those two. And then you start to look at these treasury bills and we have a treasury bill that was purchased 12-1 year two, maturing 228 year three. How many days is that? It's less than 90, isn't it? It's all of December, all of January, all of February, but February only has 28 days and it even had 29 days. It's, you know, if it was a leap year, it'd still be less than 90, right? So if a um, treasury bill has a maturity that is less than 90 days, is it a cash equivalent? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna include that one. And then we come down to this last one that has something that was purchased on March 1st, year two, and won't mature until 28, year three. Now notice they both have the same maturity, but what is the maturity to the purchaser here? It's almost a full year, right? In fact, they even called it a bond. I think they should have called it a note. I don't think it's a bond until it goes past like five years, I think they become bonds, but that's all right. We're not going to argue with the question. We're looking at the maturity dates here, and this is a full year, isn't it? So is it a cash equivalent? No. No, no. to be a cash equivalent, equivalent here, it would have needed a maturity of less than 90 days. So when I add these up, I believe I come to choice C, 1,400,000. Okay. Okay, guys, remember, this is an interactive class. You learn by doing. When you start the journey towards getting a uh, passing grade on the CPA exam in class. So you need to work these. You need to try these. And I will call you out if I think you're not uh, following along. Okay. Okay, good question. All right, let's take a look now at module two. So back to next method dealing with our next area dealing with trade receivables. Okay. Now the first one we're talking about is accounts receivable. We'll get into notes receivable later. Okay, accounts receivable. And they tell us that we need to get used to this blank account analysis format. And we're using it for the discussion of accounts receivable here, guys. But really, you could use this blank account analysis format to answer any question in which they say, therefore, the ending balance was, if they ask you that, and you see a ton of questions like that on the exam, you know that you'll have to be provided the beginning balance in that question, whatever the adds were to that account, whatever the subtracts were for the account in order to calculate the ending balance. So you sit there and say, okay, I got that. Now, where this really comes into play and more commonly the way they ask you things on the exam is they may give you the ending balance, but they'll say, how much was the sales for the period? And they give you a bunch of information about account receivable. And you're going to say, well, how can I figure out credit sales by analyzing account receivable? And the answer is, is that the um, add to account receivable for a period for the period is the amount of the uh, uh, sales, credit sales anyway, right? Okay, so that's where we're going with this stuff and that we're going to be looking and we're going to be uh, seeing how we can uh, come up, use this blank account analysis format to answer questions where maybe they're not asking me about the ending balance, they're asking me about the ad, or they may give me a bunch of information about account receivable and ask me about the cash collections. Well, cash collection is a subtract to the account receivable, right? Okay. So you need to get used to using this. I hear some folks talk about using T accounts on the exam. 
I generally discourage that because T accounts are generally good for determining an ending balance. They're not so good when you have to go back up and figure out, say, what the beginning balance was or what the adds or the subtracts were. The blank account analysis format is a useful tool that you should get used to using, not only for accounts receivable, we'll see later for allowance question, but any question in which they start asking you, well, what was the ads, et cetera, for the period. So they sit here and they show you the blank account analysis format for accounts receivable, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the T account for accounts receivable. And I'm going to show you the general journal entries that would have gone along with this information, just so you can sort of get a feel for how, you know, journal entries and T accounts relate to the blank account analysis format. But at the end of the day, this is how you should be looking at an analysis of accounts receivable. Now, in this particular question, they tell us the beginning balance was 50,000. I'm just picking, I'm not 50, but 90,000. And I'm just picking that up right here. You know, I don't need to do a journal entry for that because it's 90,000. Accounts receivable is a debit account, all right? So the beginning balance is 90,000, okay? And then they tell me that they had credit sales of 800,000. Now they're adding that to the receivable. And that's because if I had credit sales, I would have done what? I would have debited accounts receivable for, uh, what is it, 800,000? And I would have credited the sales. Right. And that 800,000, if I post it to the T account now, would increase the balance there. OK, then they tell me that there were cash collections of and they tell me there were cash collections of 810. So I would go ahead and, of course, cash collections increase the cash. So I have to debit it 810,000. And I credit the account receivable for the cash collections on those receivables because now I'm liquidating those into cash, right? So I would credit the cash, I mean, excuse me, the accounts receivable that posted there. Um, but I'm putting this in a blank account analysis format as a subtract. Accounts receivable converted to notes. Okay, sometimes you see that uh, on the CPA exam. So I would go ahead and I would debit notes receivable for that 7,000 and I would credit the account receivable, right? For the 7,000, because I converted the receivable into a note. I don't know, maybe my uh, um, maybe my credit, my uh, customers are having trouble paying me and I want something more formal than a verbal promise to pay, which is what a receivable, account receivable often is. And so I'll say, okay, look, you're having a little trouble paying me. I'm going to go ahead and convert that receivable to a note, maybe charge some interest with that, et cetera. And then they tell me that there's an account receivable that was written off. When I write off an account receivable, and we'll get to the allowance discussion here in a second, I debit the allowance for doubtful accounts for, what are they tell me, 23000 And I would credit the accounts receivable for 23000 as I write that off. So that becomes a credit to the receivable or a subtract. And the ending balance now ends up what being this 50,000. Okay. Now, again, part of the reason I'm writing the T account is you can see that if they ask me, well, what was the amount of credit sales for the period? T account doesn't really lend itself very well to that kind of analysis. Whereas the blank account analysis format you would sit there and say, well, look, if I know the beginning balance was 90 and I know that they had what? Subtracts of cash of 810 and they had subtracts of seven and they had subtracts of 23. So that means that at some point in time, they had subtracts of a total of 840, but they ended up with an ending balance of 50 then they must have had what? Before they subtracted 840, they must have had 890. If they started out with 90 and they got up to 890, they must have added 800. That would be my credit sales. 
So that's a better way to work this question than sitting there trying to use a T account. Subtotal is very important. Question. Okay. Now, how will we deal with our valuation account receivable when we have a discount? Okay. And as you know, when we have discounts, they will give us this nomenclature of 210 net 30, which as you well know, means that I'll have a 10% discount if I pay in 10 days. Otherwise, I have to pay the whole amount in 30 days. Okay. Now, when we have these cash discounts, there are two methods that we can account for these. One is called the gross method. The other is called the net method. Okay. Now let's go ahead and look at some actual numbers here. Okay. And you can see that they have this 100,000, 210, net 30. If it said 115, net 45, what would that mean? 1% in 15 days, if not 45 days. Otherwise, the whole amount of 45. Good. Okay, good. So we look at that. And um, if we are using the gross method, we go ahead and we debit the account receivable, the sales for the whole amount, assuming the uh, customer is not going to take the discount. Now, if the customer takes the discount, okay, then we would sit there and we'd say, okay, well, we got to take that 100,000. Multiply that by 2%. That gives me the $2,000 discount. And we will credit the account receivable for the whole amount. We will debit the cash for 98 because they're getting a $2,000 discount. And we debit sales discounts taken for 2000 Now, sometimes students will say, well, where does sales discounts taken show up on the financial statement? And often what you'll see, uh, I'm going to show you, that you'll see sales, you'll see this in textbooks anyway, sales will show at the 100,000, less discounts. The discount is what, 2,000 here? And the net sales would be 98,000, okay? Now, a lot of times, I, almost every time I see a set of financial statements produced by a company, you know, they start with net sales. And you should know that sales, less returns and less discounts is the net sales. Here, we're just dealing with the discount. Okay. Now, of course, if the person doesn't take the discount, no big deal. We would just go ahead and debit the cash for the 400000 and credit the account receivable for the 100000 Okay, now that's the gross method. Under the net method now, what's going to happen? Okay, so we're using the net method. Remember, we have the gross method, we have the net method. Under the net method, you assume the person is going to take the discount. If they do, very simple, debit the cash, credit the receivable. If they don't, then of course they're going to pay you the full hundred thousand cash you'll credit the account receivable for the 98. And now you're going to credit this account called sales discounts not taken. That's a credit. So ultimately that will be what? Closed to sales. In other words, it'll increase my sales. You'll eventually close that account by debiting sales discount not taken and crediting sales. Okay. Question. All right, we deal with trade discounts. And uh, the analogy that I like to use here with trade discounts, you can just write this here. I don't think they'll mind if I do a little advertising for them. I like to write Macy's here. Okay, what happens? Uh, sometimes you go to Macy's as a store. I've seen do this a lot. And you see that it says on the... Um, you know, you're looking at some shirts or something, it'll say 40% discount. And then they'll put a little tag on top of the tag and it'll say an additional 10% taken at the register. And you think, oh boy, that's a 50% discount. Is it? No. What Macy's does is they'll take what? They'll take 
40% off the original price, and then they take a 10% discount off of the already discounted price. So the CPA exam does the same thing to you. They'll call out the discounts in two chunks, trying to trick you into thinking, oh, I'll just add the two discounts together to get the whole discount. No, first you take the first discount, that gives you the discounted price, and then that second discount is taken on the already discounted price. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this. And they say they have these coats that they're selling for a thousand dollars. They're trying to sell a hundred coats. There's a 40% discount and then a 10% discount. So a thousand dollar each coat times a hundred coats, that's a hundred thousand dollars. They take that 40% discount off the first price. That means it's 60,000. And then the 10% discount does what? Comes off of that already discounted price. And so the total uh, account receivable balance now would be 54,000 after we take those discounts in two chunks. Okay, all right, good. Let's take a look at bad debt. OK, and how to account for that. Now, um, we talk about the direct write off method. It is not gap. So when you see a question contemplating something like this treatment, this is wrong. OK, the best way for you to look at this example, and I'm almost sometimes reluctant to even show it to you, is that this is the wrong way to do it. OK, under direct write off. What you would do is when the person tells you they can't pay, that's the time that you debit the bad debt expense and credit the account receivable. No, no, bad CPA. No, that's wrong. You do not do it that way. Okay. What you need to use, the correct way is what? The allowance method. And under the allowance method, we will take the bad debt at the time of the sale. We're trying to match that bad debt with the sale. Sometimes I'll get students to say, well, will there ever be a time when there won't be a bad debt expense? And my answer is yes, when you stop offering credit sales and you only accept cash sales. But as long as you offer credit sales, there will always be some amount of bad debt that you'll have to estimate, anticipate, and you will take that in the period of sale. OK, now, how do you estimate the amount of bad debt you have to take? And what you do is you take the balance sheet approach. You look to see what is the percentage of the accounts receivable that needs to be put into the allowance. So when you look at this example here, they tell us that we have this company and they have an eighty thousand uh, dollar account receivable balance and they determine that two percent of it will go bad. So they know they need 1600 in the allowance. They look at the balance sheet and presumably there's been some previous years where they've had amounts in the allowance and they see that right now there's only a thousand. Well, if you have a thousand and you need 1600, you have to increase the allowance. So you debit the bad debt expense, you credit the allowance, thus bringing the balance in the allowance account up to the desired 1600. Question. Okay, good. Now, this is a somewhat not very sophisticated method of coming up with the allowance. A more sophisticated would be to be doing using an aging. And under the aging approach, notice the older the receivable, the more we put into the allowance. If it's current, we put a little bit. If it's getting past 90 days, we start putting, you know, a larger chunk, 20% in this case. Now, it probably wouldn't work this way in practice, but if using the aging told you, well, you need 1600 and you only had a thousand, then again, you would debit bad debt expense for 600 and credit the allowance for 600. You know, um, you could get, entities can get as sophisticated as they want as to how they figure out what needs to be in the allowance. Uh, banks tend to be very sophisticated as to how they put amounts in the allowance. What they'll do, uh, I was on an assignment where Congress asked the GAO to look to see if banks were properly reporting the amount for allowance for a uh, loan loss. And so we took a look at some of the large banks and what they were doing 
was they were um, taking two groups of loans following FASB guidance in which they would take the um, individual loans, uh, like commercial property loans and stuff, and figure out loan by loan how much needed to go on the allowance. Then they would go ahead and for homogeneous loans like credit card loans and whatnot, they would have a migration analysis where they would look to see how over history their um, their credit card loans went bad. And they would say, well, we're seeing trends that are like this, and this is the amount we're going to put in the allowance for credit card loans. So um, well beyond the scope of the exam, I'm just giving you the sense that an entity can be more or less sophisticated depending on the materiality associated with their receivable balances. Okay, but we still would have ended up with that same entry. Now, you come over and they talk about how an entity might calculate the bad debt expense. Okay, and so often what a company will do is make a provision throughout the year based on sales, but under current gap, they must always then adjust that balance to see if an adjustment is needed by year end. So while they may go along during the year, basing the amount that they're putting into bad debt expense and into the allowance based on sales, by year end, they have to do what we just saw over there, which is analyze the ending balance and account receivable and see if they have enough, or frankly, see if they have too much in the allowance and they can take some out at that point. So with that, just go ahead and draw an arrow over to the example on the next page. I'm going to come back to some of this on this um, page that I'm leaving now, but I want you to come over and just take a look at this. Okay. Now, what happens? We're going to use the blank account analysis format for the allowance, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the journal entries and show you the T account for the allowance alongside the blank account analysis format, which is what you would do if you're getting an allowance question, when you get an allowance question on the exam, because you will get one. Okay, so they tell us that the balance was 20,000 at the beginning of the year, January 1st. Okay, so I'm just putting that in, allowance has a credit balance. Then they tell us that they took, based on sales, 14,000 of bad debt expense. So what would have they done? They would have debited bad debt expense for 14,000. They would have credited the allowance Well, that's any better, but that says allowance for 14000 Now, if we were to tee up the bad debt expense, we've got that debit of 14000 That's based on the sales during the year. Now, they have amounts that were written off. Well, when you write off a receivable, you debit the allowance. Tell us it's 12,000. I, I think I'm writing that journal entry unnecessarily because it's right here. They go ahead and they debit the allowance and they credit the account receivable, right? Now, when you debit the allowance, if I post that, that makes it 12,5. Okay. So they look and they say, okay, after all that, the allowance has a balance of 21,5. Now, they go ahead and they do an aging of the account receivable and the aging says, you know, you only need 20,500 in there. So they look and they say, well, I got 21,5. I only need 20,500. So I need to do what? If I only need 20,500 and I have 21,5, I need to do what? I need to take out a thousand. Okay, so to take out the thousand, you simply debit the allowance that does it, that takes it out. That brings that balance now down to the desired balance of 25, right? And I credit the bad debt expense. And when I credit the bad debt expense, now the bad debt expense for the year is not 14,000, but what? 13,000, okay? You know, 
you put amounts in during the year based on sales. Okay, companies will often do that, but you will always make an adjustment at year end, either putting more in or taking some out. Question. Now, what I didn't show you on the previous page is, well, what happens if there is a recovery? You know, you put an amount in the allowance and you put amounts in the allowance for people who really don't pay you. If somebody says, hey, I'm not going to be able to pay you and you write it off and then they come back later and say, no, actually, I have you know improved my financial situation. I can pay you. Well, that's not the person that you put that money in the allowance for. You put that money in the allowance for the person who historically really ends up not being able to pay. You. Not that particular person, but people like them, right? So what do you do? If the receivable comes back, you reestablish the receivable, debit the receivable, credit the allowance, again, to put that money back in the allowance for the real people who can't pay, not those who have a bad day, think they can't pay you and then come back later and pay you. And then of course, now since they're paying me, I'll go ahead and I'll debit cash and I'll credit the accounts receivable, okay? So if you're getting this feeling of this sort of moving target, the allowance is, it's an estimate. And we saw in our uh, discussion from F2 that we put in our footnotes that what, hey, there's estimation uncertainty associated with these financial statements. Everyone understands that. And we're doing the best we can to get that allowance to reflect what we think we won't be able to collect from period to period. Question. Okay, good. Good. I'm glad you understand that. That is easily a 10-point area on the exam. You'll probably see uh, a multi, um, you will see some multiple choice questions. You may even see a task-based simulation. So by the time you're heading into the exam, make sure you're comfortable with all that. Okay, good. Pledging of account receivable. What happens? I want to borrow some money from you. And I say, can I borrow? And you say, sure, but I want some collateral. And I start showing you around different assets and you're like, mm, I'm not sure I like that as collateral. I see you got a big accounts receivable balance though. I'll tell you what, you pledge those receivables to me. Any money that is collected off of those receivables um, will be a pledging for that note or whatever it is, the money that I'm lending you. In the event that you don't pay me, I'm going to take those receivables away from you. And I say, okay, fine, okay? If that's the case, okay, then me in that example will retain, the company retains title to the receivable, okay? And the uh, receivables are mere collateral for that loan. And all you will have to do is have footnote disclosure. You do not take away the account receivable because in effect, I still have title to those and I have simply pledged those. So there will be a footnote that says, hey, there's a lien essentially against my receivables, um, but I don't remove them from the books. Okay, now factoring is different. Okay, factoring and factoring is a process where I convert the receivable into cash by signing it to somebody called a factor. And I can do this either without recourse or with recourse, okay? With or without recourse, okay? Now, if it is without recourse, let's look at that. If it is without recourse, it means the sale is final and the factor assumes the risk of losses. If the factor, the person that bought that, receivable from the um, company is unable to collect. They have no recourse against the seller, okay? Now they show us the journal entries here. Um, they didn't put any numbers on this. So I'm gonna go ahead and make some assumptions, okay? So say I factor $1,200 of accounts receivable for $1,100.
Now you're saying, well, why would you give up receivable of 1200 for only 1100? And the reason is that I need the cash and the factor wants to make some money on this deal, right? Okay. Now we'll put down here that factor maintains margin of $100, okay? And this margin is basically an amount that the factor holds to guard against uh, uncollectible uh, receivables, okay? So um, we call that margin, okay, factor margin, Okay, you can see that there. Okay, so up front, I receive what? I receive a thousand dollars. The receivable I'm selling, so that's coming off the books. The due from factor or factor margin is the hundred. I'm hoping that he'll be able to collect on all of that and he'll come back to me uh, with that hundred dollars at some point. And then there's a loss on the receivable of a hundred. That loss is the difference between the 1200 and the what 1100 that I just factored that for. That's where that loss came from. Okay. So, and I did the loss. Now I have a loss of 100. Now, if the factor is able to collect the full 1200, then they're going to send me what an additional $100 of cash. And I will credit to from factor for a hundred. Okay, that will do what? That will liquidate that account because they've paid me now, right? Now, if they can't collect the full uh, 1,200, can they do anything to me? No, it was without recourse, but they'll keep that hundred. And so if they keep the hundred, then I will debit loss of 100 and credit what due from factor because now I no longer am expecting that money. So I credit the asset due from factor. Okay, so that amount due from factor reflects proceeds retained by the factor and protects the factor in case they can't collect some of the receivables. Question. Now that's without recourse. We said it could be without or with recourse, okay? And if it is with recourse, okay, then there is an option that the factor could come back to me and say, no, you gotta take some of these receivables back, okay? Now, if it's with recourse, it could either be a sale or borrowing with the receivable as collateral. In order for it to be a sale, we have to meet all of the following criteria. In order for it to be considered a sale, and let's go ahead and flashcard and look at what the criteria are. Um, the seller's obligation for uncollected receivable needs to be reasonably estimated. We surrender control and the future economic benefit to the buyer. So I can't go back to you later and say, hey, give me those back. I'd have to give those over to you. They're yours to try to collect. If the factor can't collect, their only recourse is that I will have to give them other receivables to go and try and collect, but I don't have to, um, uh, but I don't have to give them their cash back, okay? So let's say, I give you, you know, these receivables. These pens are your are the receivables. See those pens? I give them to you. And you turn around and you say, well, John, uh, I couldn't collect on this one. I couldn't collect on this one. I take it back and I give you a similar receivable. And I say to you, here, go ahead and try to collect on this one. I'm having trouble lining that up with the camera. Say so here. Go and collect this one. It's not this same one, but it is similar, isn't it? Same color band, whatever. Okay. And so 
I would send that to you. And we would keep doing that until you finally were able to collect everything. Okay, so it's with recourse. I don't have to give you your money back, but I may have to give you other receivables. Okay, if any of those criteria, I know where I put my pen. <laughs> Where's my good pen? Okay, if any of those criteria are not met, then it is treated as a loan with the receivable serving as collateral. In other words, well, we're back up here. Okay. Question. Okay, good. Let's talk about note receivable. Okay. And when we have a note receivable, um, now this is a written promise to pay and in order, and we get this into this more in um, the regulation class when we talk about uh, what some of the requirements are of a note, okay? Um, and um, the note receivable are written promises to pay where the account receivable is generally an oral promise, okay? Now, when we look at how we will present a note receivable, we basically say that for valuation purposes, unearned interest and finance charges are deducted from the face of the amount and the related promissory note. This is necessary in order to state the note at present value. Okay, now um, I want you to go ahead and flash card that. Okay, but let's go ahead and do a little practice with note receivable so we understand what the heck they're talking to us about here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, in this space, I guess down here at the bottom, which is not related to this discounting example. Um, so maybe we should point an arrow down so you remember what it is we're trying to do here. I wanna just use this space down here. I think is the best place to do this, okay? So just go down here to the bottom here and let's say, that a company has a uh, note receivable in which the person they've loaned the money to has agreed to uh, borrow $50,000 note payable in five annual payments of $10,000 each. So we'll pay 10,000 at the end of year one, year two, and so on until they paid back the principal at 50,000. Now the interest rate on note is 10%, okay? Now, since we have to show that note at present value, immediately upon lending that money, we will go ahead and we will debit note receivable, NR is note receivable, 50,000. And of course, we'll credit the cash because we're lending that cash out. Now on our balance sheet, we would show note receivable of 50. We have to report what is the discount on the note receivable, and then the difference between the note receivable and the discount will be the net note receivable, and that's going to be, that's NR is note receivable, and that's going to have to be present value. Okay, now this is 1-1, one, one, say we loan the money on 1-1. One, one year one, okay? Now, what we would need to do is we would take those $10,000 payments and we'd figure out, well, what's the present value of those payments? And we would look probably to a present value table and we would look to see the, um, you know, five-year row, the 10% column. And when we do, we would find a factor of 3.7, 
908. And guys, I haven't memorized the present value table, but obviously I looked this up in order to be able to show you this example, right? So 10,000 times 3.7908, that is the present value. So I would have to report that note at 37,908. So then to calculate the discount, and sometimes students get confused because they're like, well, how do you get to the discount if you have to know what the discount is to get the net? Well, we would know that the discount is the difference between the uh, 50,000 and the 37,908 or what, 12,092? I do my math right on that? Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Now we have what? We have the note receivable sitting here. Note receivable now is sitting at 50,000. Discount. Is showing 12,092. Okay. Now, when we receive the first payment on that note, they're going to do what? They're going to send me cash of 10. Well, let me do it this way. Say they pay me the cash uh, January 1st of each year, okay? But at 1231, I have to go ahead and, um, how do I want to do this? Okay, let's say they're going to send me the money on 1231, the end of each year. So at 1231, I go ahead and I debit the cash. How much are they sending me? 10,000. 10,000. I credit the note receivable. This is year one. I credit the note receivable for the 10,000. When I credit the note receivable, 10,000. Okay, now the balance is 40,000. And I go ahead and I have to record the interest revenue. The interest revenue is going to be this 37,908. I'll write it again. 37,908. What's the interest rate on this thing? Times 10%. That gives me three thousand um, seven hundred seven ninety one. Okay, give or take. Okay, and so what I'll do is I'll credit interest revenue thirty seven thousand. I mean uh, three thousand. Excuse me, seven nine one. And I debit the discount. Three, seven, nine, one. When I debit the discount, three, seven, nine, one, now the balance in the discount account is what? 8,301, something like that. Something in that ballpark. If I'm a dollar or so off, don't tell me. Okay, and so then what? Then I would report at the end of year one, note receivable, how much? How much is my note receivable? 40. 40,000. My discount is now what? Eight. 8,301. 301, give or take, okay. And so now when I look at that, I have um, somebody help me out. What is 40,000 minus 8,301? 31,699. 31,700. 31,700, give or take? Yeah. Okay, good. So when I calculate my interest now for year two, it would be what? Times 10% and so on. So you might see, and so that would be what? 3,170 or something stupid like that. 
and so on. Okay, so you will see some questions in your homework and stuff where they will be asking you to maybe go through maybe you know, one year life cycle, and then maybe ask you the interest revenue for the second year, but you really only have to do the accounting for one year's worth of amortization of the discount to get to that answer. Question? Okay, good. All right, so that's a lot for that one little thing that you show it you know, net of unearned interest and whatnot. Um, that's really kind of everything that goes into that. And the reason I put all that chicken scratch down there is for you to kind of follow along and review how you handle that because they will ask you some questions in your homework. I don't want you to get frustrated on that. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's talk about what happens with discounting. I know we see, but which is similar to factoring, but the math is different because with the note, we have an interest rate, right? Okay, in order for it to be a note, it has to have an interest rate. So we come over and if it is a, it could be like we said for the factoring of a receivable with or without recourse. If it is with recourse, then that means that what? Um, the holder of the note remains liable and there are two possible treatments. Note receivable that has been discounted with recourse, leave them on the balance sheet. With a corresponding contra account, subtract from the note receivable indicating that it had been discounted. So net net that'll show zero for that note receivable, right? Alternatively, we could simply remove the note receivable from the books and then disclose in the footnotes that we have this contingent liability in case the person uh, comes back to us, okay? So flashcard those two alternatives. The yellow that I've underlined and the blue. Flashcard those two alternatives. Now, if it's without recourse, that means that we have no further liability, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look at the process here as to how we'll calculate the amount of cash we're going to get, what any interest revenue is that we'll take on this note when we discount it uh, without recourse. We're going to sell it probably to a bank, and we're probably doing this because we had this note. We were willing to wait, in this example, 90 days, but after 90 days, we said, you know what? we're facing a cash situation where we need to collect on that note right away sooner than the 90 days and we're going to go to the bank and discount the note the bank's going to charge us interest to get the money early the exam is either going to ask how much money will you get when you discount this note or what is the net amount of interest revenue that can be recognized from this transaction okay so we take a look and we have this jordan corporation has a 40,000 note. Guys, this is completely different from the example where I wrote all over here, okay? Jordan Corporation has a 40,000 90-day note from a customer dated September 30th, year three, due September 30th, year three. So that's the 90 days and bearing interest at 12%. On October 30th, after they had hold the, the note for 30 days, Jordan Corporations takes the note to its bank, which is willing to discount it at 15% rate. In other words, the bank says, hey, look, I'll give you the money, what, 60 days early, because I'm going to give it to you after 30 days. Your, the person you bar, lent, lent this money to um, was going to wait 90 days to pay you back. So you're going to have to pay me interest for the 60 days early that I'm giving you this money. Okay, so we come over. And we take a look, and again, all that stuff that I wrote is not relevant to this example. The first thing you do is sit here and say, well, if they could have waited, how much money would they have gotten on this note? Okay, and since it was a 90-day note, on the CPA exam, guys, just use a 360-day year. It is a common accepted calculation to use a 360-day year. And a lot of times I get students say, oh, that's not okay. Well, how come it's okay on many CPA exam questions to divide by 12 when something happens in a year? We know that all months don't have equal number of days. 
yet we divide by 12 and nobody says anything, but people get worried when we divide by 360, okay? So it's not that big of a deal to go ahead and just use the 360. You will not get a materially different answer and they won't be giving you a choice between a 365 day and a 360 day year. And usually the exam contemplates a 360 because they want the math to work out evenly. So we go ahead, we take the 12%, since it was a 90 day note, we divide that by the 360, that gives me 41,200. Then we say, well, what is the bank gonna charge us interest to get that 41,200 early? They told us that what the discount rate was 15%. And they tell us that we're getting the money 60 days early. So the bank is going to charge us 1030. So if of interest. So if I could have waited the full time, I would have got 41.2. I didn't wait the full 90 days. I could only wait 30 days. So the bank charged me 60 days interest. So the bank will give me 40,170. And as I said, the question could ask you how much proceeds will they get? Or they might say, from this whole transaction, was there any interest revenue? And the answer is, yeah, 170, the difference between the amount of money I got from the bank and what I had originally loaned to my uh, lender. I mean, to my borrower. I'm the lender. Question. Okay, good. Let's take a look at a couple questions and then we'll take a break. Okay, guys, I'm going to end the poll. That's uh, two minutes. A uh, question like this, you really should be able to work in about 30 seconds, okay? But let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. And they're telling us that they factored a receivable. It's without recourse, okay? Uh, and they GAR factored the receivable to Ross, okay? And when I have trouble... With these questions, sometimes I forget who's who. Okay, so Gar held the note, they factored it without recourse to Ross the bank. So, what is this? This is a sale of Gar's account receivable to Ross with the risk of loss. Um, oops. With the risk of loss going to who? Going to Ross. 
Chris D, which most of you got right. Question? We would, um, the loan condition, the A and B could be potentials when, because they, when they said with recourse, if any of the above conditions are not met, the transfer is treated as a loan. So that's when we'd be looking at the loan options, correct? Um, if it was with recourse? Yeah. Said, loan from Ross collateralized by GARS receivable. Um, I, I, I wouldn't um, take that question the way it's written and pick A because there's a lot of different things that would be going on because I don't know what the recourse is. Yeah, the okay. recourse is something else then, yeah. But so I see what you're saying, but I, I wouldn't say, well, take that same question and then A is correct if it says with recourse. Okay, got it. Recourse, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, question? Okay, good, let's look at number two and then we're gonna take a break. We're at the two minute mark, guys. I'm gonna give you an extra minute on this question. Okay, looks like most of us have had a chance to uh, try this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end the poll here, okay? And uh, when we look at the results, um, good. Most of us got this right. This is probably a tough question. I gave you three minutes. I would think that um, it really should take you probably more like two minutes once you get more comfortable with these. Obviously no question should take you more than three minutes, right? Okay, that's basically our way we're approaching questions of the exam. And that isn't a rule of the examiners. They'll give you 
the entire four hours to work on one question if you want. Of course, you would fail the exam miserably at that point. Um, but we know we have to move along no more than three minutes. A question for any one question, which is how long we took for this one in class tonight, this one should have taken you about two minutes to work. OK, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one. The answer is C. And this is one in which they're asking me, well, what was the proceeds? What would they receive on the sale? They could have asked me what was the interest earnings on this, like we saw in the book. But this one was just asking me the proceeds. So we have a $500,000 one year note. And the note has an 8% interest rate on it. OK, now it's a one year note. If we held the note for the full year, then there would have been what? $40,000 of interest. So ultimately, we would have received what? 540, our principal plus the interest back if we could have waited the full year. But they say that after holding the note for six months, Roth discounted note at an effective interest rate of 10%. Um, you know, they said effective interest rate of 10%. That's an annual rate when they quote it like that, right? And that might be what might have messed some of us up. So what's happening? They're basically giving me 540. They're going to charge me 10%, but they're only charging me that for what? Six twelfths or half the year. Okay, so the interest that's being charged by the bank on this is 27,000. So they will go ahead and they will cut them a check for what? 513? The answer to the question. Now, as I said, the question could have asked you, well, what's the interest? And it's what we originally earned, uh, loaned, excuse me, versus the difference of what we got in the proceeds six months later. So the interest revenue would be 13000 Generally, they'll ask you one or the other. Question. Okay, you'll get good at these questions, guys. I think you'll find that they're kind of fun to work after a while once you get used to them, but you do need to practice with these. I promise you, you'll see questions like this on your exam, a good chunk of them. And uh, you can really score some uh, points, you know, working a question like this in maybe a minute and a half, building some time and a question the examiners have thought is a little tougher for you getting correct answers and that's the zone you want to be in with many of these okay good with all that i'm showing about 6 35 let's take 10 minutes we will come back at um, 6 45 okay i'm going to pause the recording and somebody please remind me to start it again when we come back because i do forget sometimes okay so we'll take about a 10 minute break Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and start back. I've resumed the uh, recording, and we are going to jump ourselves into module, is it module three now, um, uh, dealing with inventory. Okay, now, uh, inventory, as I said at the start, has long been a heavy area on the exam. It's been about a 10 point area. Um, you will see, of course, multiple choice questions, uh, but you will always also see uh, potentially task-based simulation on the exam. Now, when they ask inventory questions, they tend to get into four or five different areas. One, they want to see, do you know what actual items should be included in inventory? We're going to see that an important part of that is going to be the shipping terms as to whether or not those items are included in the inventory. The next thing they're going to want to see is, well, do you know uh, what the um, costs are that should be included in the inventory? For example, shipping costs, should they be included in the inventory? Okay. Then we're going to see, once we've accumulated the cost, how should we value that inventory? We're going to be taking a look at a couple of different methods, 
available under U.S. GAAP. One is called uh, lower cost or market. The other is called the lower of net realized value or market. We're going to have to understand both of those. Once we've determined how to value the inventory, we'll have to understand the cost flow assumptions. We'll talk about FIFO. We'll talk about weighted average. We'll even talk about something called moving average. And we'll also talk about uh, dollar value LIFO and then also something called the gross profit method. All of these are cost flow assumptions that we make when we're um, seeing how items move out of our inventory. And then, and the reason I say four or five, if you want to count this as a separate category, we have to understand how to use FIFO and LIFO and whatnot if we are dealing with a perpetual inventory system versus a periodic, okay? So that's where we're going with all of these things. Um, and when we come in, we start talking about different types of inventory. In the FAR exam, it is retail, okay? I always used to like, I always like to use the example of uh, Nordstrom, we're Nordstrom, we don't produce the clothes and whatnot that we're selling you. We do what? Uh, we buy it from a vendor and then we sell it to you retail. Okay. These other work in process, finished goods, et cetera, raw materials, all of this comes in in the BEC exam, which of course uh, will be going away. The last BEC, BEC exam will be in December of 2023. However, the managerial cost accounting components of um, that are contained now in BEC will be moving to the business accounting and reporting, the bar section. Um, right now, Golden Gate is looking at offering that bar section, in case you're wondering, uh, offering that bar section, and that will be in the, um, when we decide, the other day, now I'm trying to blank on that. John, be ready to answer that better. Um, we will be offering that in the spring of 2024. January 2024 is when we will offer the bar section. Um, in fall of 2023, September of this year, uh, we will be teaching the new exam for regulation and for FAR. Um, so the moral of all that is get this FAR out of the way, obviously, before those changes start to come in and hit you. They'll really start coming in starting around September 2023, because the last time you can take the current exam will be December of 2023. Okay, so let's just go ahead. And let's take a look, considering that we have a retail inventory, okay? And um, we have goods in transit, okay? And the shipping terms can be free on board shipping point, or it can be free on board destination, okay? Now, if it is free on board shipping point, I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence, okay? I know you know this. Free onboard shipping point title passes to the buyer when the seller delivers the goods to a common carrier when it gets on the truck, essentially. Okay. Now I'm sure that you know that, but if you want to, you can flashcard that. And um, that means usually that the purchaser pays the freight. And freight cost is part of inventory. Of course, you need to read the question. If the purchaser pays the freight, it's part of the cost of the inventory. If the seller pays the freight, then that's going to be selling cost to the seller. Okay. Um, now, Goods shipped in this manner should be included in the buyer's inventory upon shipment. Even if it hasn't shown up to the purchaser's warehouse yet, they'd still include in their inventory. So the goods were shipped, say, December 25th, and they don't arrive until January of the next year. 
they still would be included in the buyer's ending inventory. You would do what? Exclude from seller's EI's ending inventory and seller books the sale. That says seller books the sale. You can go ahead and book the sale, even though the goods haven't arrived yet because it's free on board shipping point. Free on board destination means that what? Title does not pass until the buyer actually receives those goods. Okay, so the buyer has to actually receive those in order for us to include the inventory in the buyer's ending inventory. So if the goods haven't arrived yet, we will do what? Exclude from buyer's EI, include in seller's EI, and it's what? No sale to seller. And again, I'm assuming the goods hadn't arrived yet at December 31st with those notes. Okay, question. Okay, good. In many cases, and I probably should have made so much out of that, you really need to re read the questions to see, um, you know, well, if if the purchaser pays, just you can put that. If purchaser pays freight, Okay, freight cost is part of inventory. It doesn't really have to go along with free onboard shipping point of definition, I guess. If seller pays freight charges, if seller pays freight charges, then it's going to be what? It's going to be a selling expense. And those are sometimes artfully called freight out in this case, and artfully called if the purchaser pays the freight called freight in. But freight in is added to the inventory, freight in inventory, freight in is added to the inventory, freight out as a selling selling expense okay okay good i think this is all stuff you know already now consign goods what happens here let's say you write a book after you pass the cpa exam you write a book called mothers don't let your children grow up to be cpas you try to take that to barnes and noble and barnes and noble says no we don't want to buy that book from you to try to sell at retail uh, I'll tell you what, they take pity on you, right? And they say, here's what we'll do. You can put the books up for sale in our store. And if you sell them, okay, then we will remit the sales proceeds to you and we'll take a percentage off of that. How about that? Well, if that's the case, then what? You are the cosignor and Barnes and Noble would be the cosignee. So the end of year comes, should that inventory be held in your ending inventory or in Barnes and Noble ending inventory? It's at their store. Whose ending inventory should it be held in? That's a question. It's a question that I know the answer to. Do you? The cosigner. Okay. <clears throat> so Barnes and Noble? Or you? Barnes and Noble. Okay, now let's start over again. Because I think I might caught you guys off guard. Okay, you write a book called Mothers Don't Let Your Children Go Up to Be CPAs. And Barnes and Noble says, well, we're not going to buy that book from you and hold on our inventory. But what we'll do is we'll let you have the books here. You can display them for sale. If somebody buys the books, we'll remit the sales proceeds to you minus a commission that we'll charge you 2% on every sale. 
end of year comes. Well, who's the cosine me and who's the cosine or in that? I'm the cosigner. Barnes and Noble is the cosigner, so I should keep keep it on my inventory. Good. Right. Very good. The ending inventory will be what report on the cosignors books. Cosigne, they don't have any inventory risk, et cetera, right? Okay. Okay, good. So in a consignment arrangement, the seller of the cosignor, that would be you, delivers the goods to an agent, the cosignee, that would be Barnes and Noble, to hold and sell on the cosigner's behalf, okay? Let's go ahead and put one in a flashcard. The cosigner should include the cosign goods and ending inventory because title and risk of loss remain in the cosigner, even though the cosigning physically possesses the goods. Okay, good. That's kind of a long way to go to get to that, but that's what I want. Okay, good. All right, now you come over and you take a look at, now we know what items how should we value the inventory, okay? What cost should we include in the inventory, okay? And let's take a look. We should generally carry the inventory at its cost, and we'll look at what cost to include here in a couple of minutes, okay? But there are departures from the cost basis. There are times where we will be able to write the inventory up above its cost, other times, we will be able to leave it at its cost, even if the market falls below the cost, okay? Let's look at this, okay? And there are three exceptions. And I want you to flashcard the three exceptions, okay? Exception number one, okay, right here. Number one exception, you can carry inventory at its net realizable value, which is its uh, selling price less cost of disposal. Cost of disposal, guys, when I was studying accounting, like mean like throw it away. Cost of disposal is what cost of getting rid of it, of selling it essentially, right? And they're telling us that if we're dealing with precious metals like gold, silver, you can carry that at the market value less cost of disposal delivery cost. We don't expect people to come out to the gold mines and buy the gold from us, but we have to get it to market to be able to sell it. So we would take off delivery charges, let's say, but we can carry it at whatever the accepted price is for gold because everyone agrees the value of gold per ounce at the end of a year, silver, precious metal, also farm products, but let's just keep focusing on those the precious metals here, okay? So that's flashcard number one exception, okay? The other two exceptions appear on the next page. Okay, and they tell us that um, the lower cost or market that we can carry our inventory at the uh, lower cost. Okay, if the subsequent sales price of an end product is not affected by its market value. So if the market value has dropped on steel. But we are going to take that steel and turn it into Ferrari. And we know that the price of Ferrari is going up. Okay. We can leave that steel at its original cost. We don't have to write down to market because ultimately we're going to take that steel and convert it into Ferrari. And the Ferrari market price is fine. Or the company has a firm sales contract. I've already contracted with you to sell you something at, you know, $1,000 a pound, the market has dropped to $800 per pound, but I've got a deal with you to sell it to you for $1,000 a pound. I can leave it at its cost, $1,000 a pound at that point in time. Um, I can't write it up higher, but I can leave it at its original cost because I wouldn't be able to take that gain until I actually sold it to you. Um, the person that is committed to buy that, and we'll look at this a little bit later, that person would record the loss because you're on the hook to buy it for a thousand. Okay. So, I mean, excuse me for, yeah, a thousand in that example. Okay. So those are the three exceptions. Okay. One, if it's precious metals, you can write it up to a higher than cost. You can leave it at cost if the other two exceptions, the ultimate um, product that you're going to use for that is not being affected by the drop in the um, market price or uh, we have a firm sales contract. Three exceptions. Okay. Now, when we go through, 
we're going to see that there are two methods that we can have in US GAAP. One is called the lower cost or market. The other is called the lower of cost or net realizable value. Lower of cost or market is used for LIFO inventory methods, LIFO. Everybody else uses, that's an F, everybody else uses lower of cost and net realizable value, okay? Now, as we go through and we learn these methods, and if we have to recognize a loss, because again, the market has fallen below the cost or below the, um, yeah, has fallen below the cost, then we will recognize that loss in the current period, okay? And you cannot reverse a write down. Once you write inventory down to a lower market amount, it stays down. You don't write it back up, okay? Note also that um, you don't have to call that out as a separate line item unless you consider it to be significantly material. Uh, usually it is rolled into the cost of goods sold. In other words, I would credit the inventory. If I have to write it down, I would debit cost of goods sold. In most cases, if it's a significant amount, then I could debit a line item called loss on um, you know, decline in market value of my inventory, but that, um, you know, that would be some somewhat rare for that to happen. Okay, good. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the lower of cost and or net realize and net realizable value. And under US GAAP, the lower of cost and net realizable value method is used for all inventory methods except LIFO or the retail inventory method. So flashcard that. I know I said LIFO only, but I guess retail inventory method as well. Um, flashcard that, okay? And they tell us that the lower of net realizable value principle may be applied to a single item, a category, or total inventory, okay? And I want you to put down here single item is most conservative. Single item is most conservative in flashcard that. Single item is most conservative. What do I mean by that? Well, if you were to do the entire inventory, what would happen? You'd have some items going up, some items going down. They would tend to net each other out. And so you won't have as much of a write down. If you're talking about categories like men's clothing versus women's clothing, well, again, even within those categories, some things will go up and go down. And so they will tend to net each other out. If you value each single inventory item on its own, what would happen? You wouldn't have as much opportunity. The things that are down, you'd have to write them down. And there's probably not as many things that are going to be going up at that point in time. And so single inventory method gives you the lowest value of your inventory and therefore is the most conservative. Okay. Now, when we look at the net realizable value method, okay, it is basically the selling price less cost to complete and dispose of the inventory. So we're going to look at an example here in a minute, but you can flashcard that. We will take the uh, selling price, subtract cost to dispose, like shipping costs. That gives us net realizable value. Let's say that net realizable value number is 30. We look at the cost of the inventory. If the cost of the inventory is what? 37, we write it down to 30. If the cost of the inventory was 38, then what? Then we would go ahead and we would, okay, start over, rewind. I don't think I was saying that right. We would take the uh, sales price, say is 40, cost to dispose is five, that gives us 35. Okay, that's our net realizable value. We compare that to cost. Okay, if what the cost was 30, we would go ahead and leave that at 30. If the cost was 40, we would write it down to what? To the 35, lower of cost or net realizable value. And we'll look at an example here in a minute. Now, under lower of cost or market, okay, 
Now we use that for uh, LIFO or dollar value retail method, flashcard that, okay? And again, that may be applied to what? To a single item of inventory, the entire inventory or categories, same point, single item is most conservative there, okay? Now, when we're using lower cost or market, okay, let's take a look. And we have to come up with that market value. So then we can compare that to cost, figure out which is lower. We'll write it down to the lower, okay? So they tell us that the phrase, and there's only US gap on the exam, lower cost or market, generally means current replacement cost, whether by purchase or reproduction, provided the current replacement does not exceed the net realizable value, which we're calling the market ceiling. So that same term, net realizable value, comes up again. And we know that net realizable value is what the selling price less the cost is exposed um, or um, fall below the net realizable value reduced by normal profit, the market floor. So you can put here, use middle amount use middle amount between, I probably should have written that elsewhere, either the replacement cost, the market ceiling, or the market floor, okay? Now, flashcard, the definition of market ceiling, which is net realizable value, which is the selling price, less cost to dispose, flashcard market, value, uh, market floor, which is net realizable value, minus a normal profit. When I was looking at these questions when I'm studying for the exam, I kept messing them up until I committed to memorizing the definition of market ceiling, market floor. Now, the market value that we will use will be the middle amount, okay, between the replacement cost, market ceiling, and market floor. So the problem, and we're going to look at some examples in a minute here, the problem will give you the replacement cost. And you're going to want to say, okay, is that replacement cost more than the cost or less than the cost? Okay. But you have to first evaluate that replacement cost. You evaluate it against the market ceiling, the market floor. If the replacement cost is more than the ceiling, use the ceiling as your market. If the replacement cost falls below the floor, use the floor as your market. And if the replacement cost is not over the ceiling and not below the floor, it is the middle amount, use the replacement cost, and then compare to your cost to see which is lower. If the replacement cost is lower, write it down to the uh, lower market at that point. If the floor, if the cost is lower, then leave it at the cost. Okay. Now with all that, I know that gets a little, huh? Let's just look at these examples and you'll see it's pretty easy. Okay. Now you look and generally in a question, you would start with the replacement cost versus the cost and you want to see what is lower but before you can use replacement cost you have to figure out well what is my market ceiling i'm just going to put a c here what is my market floor i'm going to put an f here for the floor okay so my market ceiling is what 25 minus the cost of completion and disposal which is then giving me 24 minus a normal profit gives me 18. So now when I look, and you can see those same calculations down here, the ceiling is 24, the floor is 18, but the replacement cost is what? 19. So it hasn't gone above the ceiling. It hasn't fallen below the floor. I'm just going to put 19 here. Okay, it hasn't gone above the ceiling. It hasn't gone below the floor. So I can go ahead and what? Use the 19. I compare the 19 to the cost, which is lower. Not a trick question. Which is lower? Guys, am I gonna mm -hmm. keep all, find, finding you asleep at the switch? Which the is lower? The replacement cost. The replacement cost is lower, so I would carry that at 19. Okay. Okay, good. Guys, don't tune out. Okay, good. Now you come over 
And let's try another one. We take a look at item two. Okay, item two costs is 26, replacement cost is 20. But can I use that replacement cost? I calculate the market ceiling. 30 minus two is what, 28? 28 minus seven is 21. Uh-oh, our replacement cost has fallen what? Below the floor. So I have to use the floor. I compare the floor of 21 to the cost of 26. Obviously what? The 21 is lower. So I'm going to go ahead and report it at the 21 at the floor. Question. You should work these other two. I'm not going to do it right now for the sake of time. Okay. But you should be very good at these. Okay. And then again, you can either debit cost of goods sold or credit the inventory if you have to write it down. Um, or you can debit a line item, which would report on the income statement, inventory loss due to decline in market value, if you consider that to be material. Okay. All right. Good. Now, if it's lower of cost or net realizable value, then I don't have to essentially calculate the floor to compare to the replacement cost. Selling price is 30. Okay, cost of completion is three. That gives me 27. The 27 is what is lower than the cost. I would report it at 27. Question. Okay, good. Now you come over in periodic versus perpetual, okay? Now what happens? Under periodic, we will basically um, account for our inventory using this format below. I think you probably know this already, but you really, really need to make sure that you're comfortable with this. So you take what? Beginning inventory plus purchases, any freight in cost paid by the um, buyer would be included in that. That gives you the cost of goods available for sale minus ending inventory, which is based on a fiscal count, allows you to calculate the cost of goods sold. These days, many, many companies use the perpetual system, but the exam still likes to ask about periodic systems sometimes, okay? So we want to be comfortable with that. Perpetual system, we will go ahead and we will account for our inventory after each purchase and sale occurs. We will literally be debiting our inventory when we purchase items, crediting items when we, crediting inventory when we sell items, and of course, debiting cost of goods sold, okay? Now, um, most companies these days will use perpetual, okay? Um, but sometimes you may have a test question that asks you the, the periodic, okay? Now let's go ahead and look at an example um, that helps us to kind of understand the difference between the two. And so we have this, um, well, they messed this example up, this is my recollection. It used to be a much better example. Okay, let's, I'm, I'm going to mark this up a little bit. Okay, all right, so here we go. This is the perpetual system. Okay, perpetual system. Okay, and when you buy the inventory, you debit the inventory for 300000 and you credit the cash, right? Now, let's say that they go ahead and um, they sell and they sell, uh, we'll say, $100,000 worth of the inventory, okay? What journal entry, let's say they sell it for, not very important for this example, let's say they sell it for 500,000. Okay, they sell 100,000 worth of the inventory and they sell it for $500,000. We'll just say they sell it for cash. What would be the debit for the sale? I mean, the journal entry for the sale. They sell it for cash, 500. Okay. Debit cash. Debit cash, good, 500,000. <clears throat> Credit what? Sales. Sales for 500000 Good. 
How about the inventory? They sold 100,000 worth. Cost of sales, debit. Cost of goods sold, debit for 100,000? Yes, <laughs> inventory. And credit the inventory, good. Okay, good. So if when they purchased it, the inventory was showing 300,000 and they just credited it, that would equal credits, John. Now there's what, 200,000 left in the inventory? Yes. And my cost of goods sold is 100,000. Now, when you use the periodic method, you don't update the inventory and the cost of goods sold after each purchase of inventory and after each sale. But when you buy the inventory, again, assuming you bought 300,000 worth, you would debit the purchases and credit the cash. Now, if you sell it, okay, when you sell it, same journal entry for the sale. But now for my cost of goods sold calculation, what would I have to do? I'd have to go and count the inventory, okay, to get this correct for the cost of goods sold. Now, just assume that this company just began operations. And if they just began operations, what's the beginning inventory? Zero. Good. And then I had purchases. And my purchases were what? 300,000. Yeah. Good. So I had goods available for sale of 300,000. Now I have to count the inventory. And when I count it, and I know by peeking at my example here for perpetual, of course, I'd have to actually physically go count the inventory. When I count it, I know that my ending inventory is how much? 200,000. 200, so my cost of goods sold is going to be, and you're like, yeah, I know, John, you just told me that, but I would have had to have counted the inventory to calculate that under the periodic method. So now under periodic, where do I want to write that journal entry? Down here for periodic. Under periodic now, what would I do? I would go ahead and I would debit cost of goods sold for 100,000. I debit the inventory for what? 200,000 and I credit purchases. I closed the purchases. I don't need that account anymore. I simply needed it to help me. It was a means to the end. I needed that account to help me get to my cost of goods sold. So by the end of the year, presumably or whatever, when I counted the inventory, I'd be able to calculate my cost of goods sold. Notice guys that at the end of the day, we still have what? The same amount reporting the cost of goods sold in the inventory. It was just simply how we got there. Okay. Question. So if you do this method, uh, Professor, there would be a chance of accounting as sales for inventory that are lost or damage. You, you wouldn't count inventory uh, sales, but yeah, your cost, I often tell students, they should call it cost of goods sold and stole, right? Because all I know, I don't know for sure that I sold it, I just know that it ain't here anymore, right? Yeah. When I counted the inventory and saw 200,000 left, for all I know, 50,000 where it got stolen. I don't know. I'm assuming I sold it, right? That's why most companies would use perpetual now. It provides a better control over the um, inventory, right? Because if I'm having a lot of theft going on and I'm looking at my accounting records and my accounting records is telling me under the perpetual method that I have, you know, 200,000 of inventory. And I look out there, I'm like, that ain't looking like 200,000 to me. What's going on? I may be able to, you know, make some adjustments in my inventory controls to prevent some of those thefts, right? Roy? Yes, exactly. Okay, good. Okay. All right, uh, cost flow assumptions, okay? Uh, 
specific identification, then FIFO, then LIFO, um, and then, uh, well, FIFO weighted average, and then LIFO. Specific identification method, okay? This is usually used for physically large or high value items, okay? For example, car sales, okay? If you're talking about a sale of a car, you know, they've got the level of detail on what's in a car down to the seat belts, okay? You want the premium seat belts with the golden buckles or you want the regular seat belts, right? So something like that's gonna be perpetual, okay? First in, first out. First in, first out says that the uh, first thing I buy is the first thing I sell you, okay? Now, I'm not trying to um, insult anyone's intelligence, okay? I know you know this, but let's say we've got milk, right? And we have some milk and uh, some of these milks were bought on um, February, we'll say January 31st, and they're costing 475. And let's say we're Safeway. Okay, the big S on Safeway. And the delivery truck delivers those into the milk freezer. Um, there's some that had come in on January 15th. Those were 450. Okay. And there were some, don't worry about the milk going rotten, that were delivered on January 1st. And those cost Safeway 425. Now, what happens? You come along in your shopping cart, whatever, right? Okay, that's you. And you go ahead and under the cost flow assumption, they assume that the ones that you put into your cart are what? The 425 ones? The ones that are what? So this is the cost of goods sold for Safeway. The ending inventory is these that are back here, these 475 ones, maybe these 450 ones, whatever, right? If the sale price is $5, then what happens? Safeway's gross profit would be how much? 75. 75 cents, good. Okay. All right, good. Now that's what we mean by uh, first in, first out. I know you know that. The first inventory items are the first cost transfer to cost to get sold. That's what happened. Ending inventory includes the most recently incurred cost. Thus, ending balance approximates replacement cost. At the end of the accounting period here, I'm assuming July 31st, I mean, January 31st, they would have to pay what if the truck backed up and crushed all those in order to replace them, they'd have to pay 475 per carton of milk or whatever, wouldn't they? Okay, so flash card that as an advantage of FIFO. That's an advantage because the ending inventory is showing what? Is showing pretty much what it would cost us to replace those, okay? Also flash card in periods of rising prices. Are we in a period of rising prices? Right, so the exam might actually like to ask this right now. In a period of rising prices, the FIFO method results in the highest ending inventory, right? That's what we have right here. The costs are going up. These items which are higher in cost are in the ending inventory. The lowest cost of goods sold, okay, because these 425 ones are in our cost of goods sold, flash, um, and therefore the highest net income because what our um, current sales price, which are probably based on 475, but we're matching those older costs. And so our net income is higher. It does not match the current revenues flashcard that as a 
disadvantage of FIFO. So flashcard everything that's here in this pass key, but also add that uh, not matching current cost with current revenue is a disadvantage. of FIFO. And as I tell you this, don't forget that there will be written communication on your BEC exam. And when you have written communication on the BEC exam, they can ask you anything from any of the four parts of the exam. And often when you write an essay question, they like to ask you what are advantages, disadvantages, compare, contrast, that kind of thing. So I'm also, I'm asking you to flashcard for this exam, but keep in mind that that information would, could potentially be helpful for you on the BEC exam. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over and let's just look at a numerical example here of FIFO. And these tell us that during its first year of operations, this Helix Corporation has purchased all of its inventory in three batches. Batch one was for 4,000 units at 425. Batch two was for 2,000 units at 450. And batch three was for 3,000 units at 475. In total, 4,000 units were sold, 3,000 units after the first purchase, and 1,000 units after the second purchase. And they want us to figure out what would be the ending inventory and the uh, cost of goods sold under both, right there, the ending inventory and the cost of goods sold under both the periodic and the perpetual system, okay? Now, I had a dream that, the quest that a question like this appeared on the exam. And they did it in the exam, they did it for FIFO, they did it for LIFO, they did it for weighted average, okay? That was a task-based simulation. And uh, they asked for both the periodic and the perpetual system, okay? Um, now, what I want you to do is I want you to flashcard these facts. And when you flashcard these facts, and when you come to a question, and when you come to this, I should say in your flashcards, stop get a piece of paper and be able to do this. So in other words, we're gonna have you practicing with the potential task-based simulation in the middle of your flashcards, okay? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. And we can see that what they sold, and let's just review what's happened. They bought um, a total, purchased a total of what? 9,000 units, right? They sold how many? 4,000. So their ending inventory is going to be at 5,000 units. The question is, how are we going to value these? Okay, now if they sold 4,000 and it's first in, first out, these are all gone, aren't they? So these will not contribute to the ending inventory, okay? But these 5,000 units, 2,000 were valued at 450, 3,000 were valued at 475. That gives us an ending inventory of 23,250. We add up all those purchases. They didn't have a beginning inventory here because they just started operations, but those purchases total 4,250 minus the ending inventory gives us what? Gives us cost of goods sold of 17,000? Question? Okay, good. Now, if we're using perpetual, then we will have to do what? We will have to account for our inventory after each purchase and sale of inventory. So when they buy the inventory, they're going to go ahead, buy those at 425, that's 17,000. Okay, great accounts payable, cash, whatever, debit inventory. Then when they sell them, they come out at the 425. So they go ahead and they credit the inventory. They debit 
the cost of goods sold, and now the inventory is showing four thousand two fifty, right? Then they bring in those two thousand at four fifty. That gives me what? That gives me thirteen thousand two fifty now in the inventory. I debit the inventory, I credit the cash or whatever. And then when I sell those next thousand, I use my. I still had a thousand items left at that four twenty five. So I credit my inventory forty two fifty. I debit the cost of goods sold, and then I bring in those uh, three thousand, and I didn't sell any of those. So by the end of the year, my inventory balance is showing me what that I have these twenty three thousand two fifty left, and the cost of goods sold is seventeen thousand. I don't have to do any you know calculation of goods available for sale and whatnot because my account balances show me what's in the cost of goods sold in the inventory at any point in time. Notice, guys, you get the same answer because what we assumed for under priority versus perpetual, because we assume that all those items went out at 425, right? Okay. Now, if I'm on a task-based simulation and they ask me FIFO, LIFO, LIFO weighted average, I'm going to do the weighted average first. It's the easiest one. And I would do that first, then I would do FIFO, I'd say the LIFO for last. Weighted average is the easiest one because all you do is you weight each purchase at its proper dollar amount, its unit cost. That gives me what? Total 40,250, I purchased 9,000 units. I go ahead and I divide the total cost in my inventory by the total units that were available in my inventory. That gives me what? This 4.7222 on the exam. Usually on the exam, guys, um, the numbers won't be this irrational. Okay. But if you do give you some sort of weird number on your calculator, use the irrational number. Don't round it for the purposes of making a calculation like this. And so we go ahead and that's what they did. And for my cost of goods sold, since I sold 4,000, I go ahead and I do that. Since I sold what, uh, since I still have 5,000, I should say, I use that to calculate the ending inventory. Now, moving average was not part of that task-based simulation that I had a dream about, okay? But let's review it because you might get a multiple choice question. And with moving average, now we compute the weighted average cost after each purchase by dividing the total cost in available in inventory after each purchase, okay? Now, um, in order to use moving average, a perpetual inventory system is necessary. Go ahead and flashcard that. And let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Okay, and see how this moving average works. So 4,000 times 425, 17,000 units come in. Of course, the average is what? 425, 4,000 divided by 17,000 gives me the 425. We know that, okay? When I sell those first 3,000, they go out at 425, okay? So I will go ahead and debit my cost of goods sold, credit my inventory for this 12750 Then I bring in what? An additional 2,000 units at 450. So I add 9,000 of cost onto my 4,250. So now I'm gonna calculate a new moving average by taking that 4,250 plus the 9,000. That then gets divided by 3,000. And I have a, I mean, uh, yeah, 3,000 units. The um, thousand that I had plus the 2,000 I added brings me to that 3,000. That's where that number came from. And I go ahead and I divide that, and that gives me a new moving average. So now when that next sale occurs after that second purchase, when I sell those 1,000, I use that new moving average cost to figure out what this sale is. And of course, at that point, I would go ahead and debit my cost of goods sold, credit my um, <clears throat> ending inventory for now 4417 for those 1,000 units. Then when the 3,000 units come in, I go ahead and at this point, I have 8, 3, 8833. 
I'm going to add 14,250 more of cost for those 3,000 that came in at 475. I had what, 2,000 units. I'm adding 3,000 more. So I have 5,000. The 833 plus the 14,250 divided by the 5,000 now gives me a new moving average. And then I would go ahead and, um, you know, my next sale would go out at that new moving average. Okay. So what I would like you to do is, even though it wasn't part of that potential task based simulation, flashcard the uh you don't have to write the facts again but make a flashcard that says now using the same facts that you just looked at a minute ago on the previous flashcard now do it for moving average so that you're practicing these methods as you're going through your flashcards right you don't have to rewrite the facts on the flashcard just say now same facts as the previous flashcard now do this for moving average and then we're going to continue that approach with uh, LIPO. But before we do, any question on moving average? Okay, good. If it's LIFO, let's take a look. And they say under LIFO, the last cost inventoried are the first cost transfer to cost of goods sold. Now, the best thing I can use for uh, LIFO is the pile effect. Okay. And so let's say you're going and you're buying like some decorative rock or something for your backyard and you see the pile of the rocks that you like and here's the delivery truck for the rock guys, okay, Rock Incorporated, RI, okay, and what happens? The rocks get delivered on the top. Here you come with your truck, okay, this is you, this is the customer. And what happens now when you get the inventory, you take the ones off the top. So if these had come in at January 1st, these had come in at January 15th, and these had come in at January 31st, under LIFO, now what? The last cost transferred to cost of goods sold, or the um, last cost inventory are the first cost transferred to cost of goods sold. So you're putting these 475 ones in your truck. So what happens? This is the cost of goods sold. If they're selling them for $5, I don't know, whatever it is, a pound or whatever, how they sell rocks, what's the gross profit for this company? 25 cents. 25. 25 cents, right? Okay. So ending inventory, therefore, includes the oldest cost and therefore the ending inventory balance will not reflect replacement cost flash card that is a disadvantage of lipo okay because it's showing 425 meanwhile you gotta pay 475 for those items lipo does not generally relate to the actual flow of goods for most companies, okay? Yeah, for this rock company maybe, but that's a disadvantage. But a company can choose LIPO. Even though your inventory doesn't actually flow that way, you can choose it. But what happens? US GAAP says that if you use LIPO for tax purposes, it must be used for GAAP purposes as well. In period of rising prices, companies want to use LIFO because it's going to generate what? A lower net income. And so they want to use it for tax purposes because they don't have to pay as much tax. FASB says, well, if that's the case, we're not going to let you report a higher profit on your income statement and then get away with paying lower taxes. So LIFO conformity rule says that you have to use it both for tax purposes. You use it. For tax purposes, you must use it for financial statement purposes. Okay. Now, the LIFO method generally better matches expense against revenue because we're doing what? We're showing the current costs associated with these items against the current sales price. Flashcard that as an advantage of LIFO.
that's an advantage of lipo that it does a better job matching okay um <clears throat> and therefore it, it uh, eliminates holding gains okay but if sales exceed production there will be a distortion of net income that's a major uh disadvantage it makes lipo susceptible to income manipulation flashcard that as a major disadvantage that says disadvantage of lipo in fact, beyond the scope of the exam, IFRS has eliminated LIFO as a viable method for accounting for inventory, mainly because of this problem, okay? Because what happens? Let's say, going back to this little example up here, I say, hey, I see Rock Company have a gross profit of 25 cents. I can improve that. And I say, don't buy any inventory for a while. So what happens as inventory gets sold, we go down, we go down, and finally we're down sort of to the bottom of that pile down there, right? And things are at what? 425. And so now, because we've eliminated those higher layers by not buying any more inventory, no more stuff was being put at top, on top. Now, if I sell them for $5, which is the current going rate for these rocks, and I match against it these older costs now of 425, suddenly I'm showing a gross profit of 75 cents. Am I a genius? I look like a genius because, wow, look at it. He, he, he tripled our gross profit in a matter of a year or whatever, right? And then I take off and I go on to the next company. Meanwhile, this company has a big problem looming and that they're going to have to replenish their inventory at what? At a pretty high cost. All of a sudden, uh, that could, you know, lead to some operational problems, right? Okay. Also, flashcard that in periods of rising prices, LIFO method generally results in the lowest ending inventory because we've got these 425 ones down here, the highest cost of goods sold, and the lowest net income. Question. Okay, good. Now let's go ahead and let's take a look at this uh, LIFO example. Same facts. So let's make another flashcard. Another flashcard that will say same facts. Now we want you to do the ending inventory cost of goods sold. Uh, both for the periodic and the perpetual system. Okay, mm -hmm. now, if you've been out to lunch mentally here, come back because this is where it gets pretty interesting. Okay, now what happens? We go ahead and we have these items. Uh, let's just remind ourselves we bought 9,000. We sold... 4,000, so we have an ending inventory, what, 5,000, just to remember what we did. When we sell under LIFO, okay, looking at periodic first, we assume that we, what, sold all those 3,000 first, so those are all gone. We, what, sold a total of four, so 1,000 of those 450 ones are sold, but another thousand are still sitting in ending inventory, aren't they? Because we have to total up to 5,000 in inventory, the four plus the one. So the thousand times the 450 means we have 4,500. And we assume under LIFO that we haven't sold any of these 425 ones yet. So now our ending inventory for 17,000 plus 4,500 is 21.5 goods available for sale of 40,250 minus the um, ending inventory gives us cost of goods sold of 18,750. Now, this is where it gets interesting, guys, in that when we um, use perpetual. Remember, we have to update our inventory and our cost of goods sold after each purchase, after each sale. So we buy the items, we debit inventory, we credit cash, whatever. And then when we sell the items, 
since we have to update our inventory after each sale and we haven't bought those 450 ones yet because that second purchase came after the um, first sale then we take the only cost we have in our accounting system to debit the cost of goods sold and credit the inventory we didn't have any other number in there at that time we had to update our inventory we only knew about the 425 ones then a little bit later we buy those 450 ones those come in okay and we debit the inventory for the nine thousand credit the cash or whatever okay and now when we sell the thousand which came after that second purchase we have a later number in there the 450 so those thousand now come out at what come out at 450 we credit the inventory we debit the cost of goods sold and then we bring in those 475 ones under um, lifo now uh, we would have those have to be an in inventory because we're using the uh, perpetual system so we add those in and we'd end up with the 23,000 and the 17,250 so under lifo you very well could do what get a different answer under periodic versus perpetual question Okay, good. Dollar value LIFO. Let's look at that. Okay, I want to get us through this module, guys, because I want to make sure you can um, work all the questions this module. Okay, dollar value LIFO. And dollar value LIFO basically sits here and adjusts the inventory for um, increase in the changing price levels. Okay. Now, what you're going to do, and they'll say, oh, it's an internally computed price index. And when they tell you that, that means you, CPA candidate, will calculate it. When they say it's internally computed, I don't know, I would look, okay, well, where is it then? That means you have to calculate it, okay? And what you'll do is you will take the total ending inventory uh, at current cost and divide it by the total ending inventory at base year cost. It's important that you put that word total there, guys, because I think that students make a mistake. They want to calculate the price index just based on what got purchased in the period. No, it's the total. Okay, you use the total. So it'd be beginning plus whatever you purchase. Okay, so what happens in a question? they would have to give you whatever the ending inventory was at base year. They would have to give you whatever the ending inventory total was at current year. Don't calculate the index based on the layer. Do it as the total as of the end of the period that they're asking you about. So in this example now, <clears throat> we're looking Sorry, I had something on my screen here that I need to get off. So we're looking here and we take what? We take the 54,000, the total, divided by 45. That gives me a price index of six fifths. And then I go ahead and I take the current year layer. I adjust it for that inflation and the current year layer now adjusted came in at an adjusted amount of 6,000. I bring that in and I would report my ending inventory at the end of year one under dollar value LIFO at 46. Now, most questions will probably just have you do one year, but if they were to add a second year, they would have to tell you what the layer was at base year, what the layer was at current cost. You add that on to last year's ending, which is this year's beginning. Year, year one's ending is year two's beginning. I go ahead, add that on. I use the total. You see why that total, when I wrote that up there, is so important, okay? Don't calculate the index based on the layer. Do it by the total. And so I pick those two numbers up. The, they missed a comma in there. That's 80,000. They need a comma right there. Okay, so they have what? 80,000 divided by 60. That's four thirds. I take that four thirds, I pick up the layer at base, I convert it to the current, 
And then I take that and I add that on. That gives me the 66,000. The correct answer to this question, if they were asking me at the end of year two, uh, typically questions will ask you, um, you know, after one year. Okay. If it is the index is supplied, okay, and here they tell us to still calculate the index. Why? If they give me the index, I don't have to calculate it. They tell me the index is 1.1. They give me the inventory at base. If at base it was 500 and now it's at 525, that means at base they added what? They added 25,000. I convert that base into the current cost by using that index as 27.5. So now I would take the 500,000 plus the now adjusted for inflation base here. And they gave me the index, so I didn't have to calculate at 1.1. That gives me the ending inventory at 527,500. So if they give you the index, you don't have to recalculate it. Just figure out what was the layer at base convert that layer to current cost using that index that they provide you. Okay, we're running a little tight on time. Um, how do I wanna do this? Okay, let's, so here's what's gonna happen because I don't think we're gonna have time to, to, to do the questions. Um, the way I would like to do them. Um, so I will ask you to look at those class questions. Well, how do I want to do this? Ugh. Let's just roll with this. Let's see what happens, okay? Uh, gross profit method, okay? With the gross profit method, okay, we're going to basically um, use this to calculate the cost of our sales using the gross profit method. And this is often the case in CPA exam questions. They like to say, well, the inventory was destroyed. What was the value of the destroyed inventory? Okay. So they tell us that the gross profit is 80%. Well, if the gross profit is 80%, then the cost complement is what? The cost complement is going to be 80%, okay? And in this example, they tell us where sales was 200,000. We know what the beginning inventory was. We know what the purchases were, but we don't know what the ending inventory should be because it got flooded and it got destroyed. So what do we do? We take the beginning inventory, we add the purchases, that gives me the goods available for sale, to come up with the cost of the items that were sold, we take what? We take the 200,000 times that 80%, that gives me cost of goods sold of 160. That means the inventory that's not here for me to count anymore must have been what? About 40,000. Okay. Firm purchase commitment, guys. If you are committed, to purchase inventory at a certain amount, say $5 million, and then the price of that inventory drops to say 4 million, you are required to calculate a loss and you will book that loss. You'll debit the loss, you'll credit a liability, even though you haven't taken that inventory yet. Rule of conservatism, right? Because you're committed to buy it at that higher price when the value of that inventory has dropped. Okay, all right, so I think for the sake of time, yeah, I'm gonna just, I, I don't wanna try to rush this. Here's what I'm gonna do. You should do your homework, okay? But I will come back on next week, Tuesday, and I will start here. I'll work these two questions with you because I do have some test taking technique that I wanna spend a little time talking to you about is how to tackle questions like this. So if I forget, remind me that we're going to work these two questions and then we'll wrap up chapter three next time and potentially uh, start chapter four. Question? Okay, guys, I will see you next week. You should be able to work 
really through a module, even though we're going to come back to those two questions, but you should be able to work through module three and we'll pick up module four next time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. You. Bye. Yeah. Good night, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.